Okay, welcome to Church Online this morning, uh, Bethel Christian Fellowship. Anyone in Geelong or around the world listening, my name's Angus Giles and it's a fabulous honour for me to bring the Word of God to you today. So let's pray as we get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day where we've got breath in our lungs and we're alive. Thank you, Lord, that you've redeemed us. You've put our names in the book of life. And Lord, thank you that you're calling us to a life of... Um, supernatural empowerment of love and of healing and of goodness and lord we thank you that your light outshines the darkness and together we proclaim that over Corio. so guys just join with me that god's light triumphs over darkness here in Corio. so let's get started this is all about evangelism today and about bringing the light of god uh, to overcome the darkness here in Corio. We've boy, we're called here to, to minister and to sort of own this place of, of Corio, if you like, and just take responsibility in a spiritual sense. We had a pro fantastic uh, sermon last week from a fabulous young Australian fella in, uh, in uh, New York who was teaching that to have authority in your prayers, you need to have the agony of of uh, identification with the people who you're you're praying for so let me say that again to have authority in heaven as we pray for revival in Corio, we need to get down on street level with the people in Corio and feel their pain and join together and um, that's just a beautiful thing uh, so today we're going to be evaluating a few different uh, evangelistic strategies that some of the guys in Bethel have been involved in the last couple of weeks uh, myself and Marie um, and and others you'll see in a minute on the screen but we're experimenting here uh, not just with video technology and digital technology to sort of do church but to in how we reach out um, because uh, so we're experimenting in reaching out. Now, there's something I really want. I think the Lord wants you to, to get today. And that is this um, uh, continuum that I'm going to show you on the screen there, where you have on the one hand, on this side, you have, say, the pre-Christian. In the middle might be conversion, adolescence, and then mature Christian. Uh, now, let me say that again, on this side, you, it's, and that represents the growth of your, the Christian journey. So when we, uh, before we become a Christian, God's calling us and we're thinking about the big questions in life. We're wondering about our meaning and our purpose. We're perhaps lost and hungry for, for righteousness. We might be sheep without a shepherd. We might be um, searching for the Lord. Uh, okay. And then there's the time when we sort of become a Christian and make a decision to follow Jesus. And then, then there's this sort of adolescent, youthful time of learning and struggling and being sanctified. And, and then there's a period of maturity where we're um, able to really resist the attacks of the enemy. We're strong in our, our physical and uh, relational and spiritual place and able to minister the kingdom as warriors for Christ. Now, the reason I want you to understand that continuum is because we at Bethel are choosing to focus on the two extremes of that continuum. One is evangelism and one is maturity, uh, empowering warriors for Christ. Now, the reason for that is, is because the Lord's calling us. We can sense it. We know that the Lord's calling us to minister to the brokenhearted, to the lost, to the hungry here in Corio, which is like the pre-Christian um, group or type of person. Uh, and we, most of us, are pretty strong uh, in the Lord, able to bring prayer ministry, prayer healing, uh, strong at intercession, able to control our flesh and die off to our flesh and, and, and listen to the Holy Spirit and walk in the, in the, in the things of the Spirit. The main bit in the middle, which I'd call the early Christian walk and the adolescence, is really done most mainly by other churches uh, in Geelong and all over Australia. That tends to be where they focus. They'll often ask the people, make a decision to follow Jesus. And, and so they're focusing in on that decision time around the conversion time and also the early walk of Christianity, learning to sort of bring God to be the centre of your life and learn how to bring your, your life to start the process of sanctification. 
Whereas we're at Bethel going to focus on the pre-Christian and the mature Christian. Uh, basically, those two come together, as you notice. The mature Christians are the ones generally will be bringing the, the, the new life to the pre-Christians and, and inspiring and empowering and, and bringing evangelism. That's what we're focusing on today. But before we do that, I need to mention that the main love of the Father for you and I is, is, a, is, is, a, is a soft, warm, embracing love. And um, for you and, and for me. And so this warrior for Christ thing that I'm teaching today is uh, not for everyone. It depends sort of where you are on your journey. And we all come back to the same place of being embraced by God, cherished as a, as a child of God, if, on his lap, if you like, being held and cuddled. We all come back to that place of God just loves you. It doesn't matter what you do, whether you do bad or good or super good, it, he just loves you the way you are, irrespective of that. And we really need to let that soak into each and every little molecule of our being and our, and our identity that we are deeply beloved by our Heavenly Father. And uh, that any sort of uh, outreach of love or, or kindness to another person would come from a place of plenty, a place of peace and a place of acceptance so that we're not striving to please God by doing good works, but where uh, it's an overflow of joy that because we're redeemed, because the Holy Spirit is flowing up within us like an irrepressible fountain. We want to share that love of Jesus with other people. And that's a very important distinction that uh, our resting place is in being accepted, washed in the blood, made righteous by Jesus and given a, a garment of righteousness uh, and, a, and a ring on our finger of sonship. Uh, and, and we're sons and daughters of the king. Uh, before we do anything else. Okay, so we've made that point. Um, so it, look, um, moving on to uh, um, uh, evangelism. Now, if we put all that in place and we say, okay, let's focus on the, the group of pre-Christians and bring that front and centre. Now, that is a really radical shift for a church to do. Um, some churches get their people to click a button on a website which does mission and there'll be a picture of an Indian kid on the little starving kid or a hungry, they'll be doing mission overseas. And I've got nothing wrong with that. But the Lord's calling us to do mission here in Corio. So um, to say that the people around us, there are lots of them who are lost and broken and need to know Jesus. So when it comes to love your neighbour, obviously... For each of us, it starts with ourselves. We have to be nobly to ourselves and love ourselves. It means we get enough rest, enough discipline, enough goodness. Um, with the next level of care is obviously our family. And if we have, um, that's our parents, is to honour our parents and to forgive them and to just really put them in a place of honour in our hearts, even if they've been terrible. We need to work on that and we need to love them if we're younger and they're still alive is to, is to honour them. Obviously siblings, we need to honour them and if we're married or have children, uh, our spouse and our children. That's our primary mission field if you like. So any love that we are offering to any strangers or people out there in the world or at work or at school is um, offered once we've got those other primary relationships primary responsibilities going pretty well um, then uh, we can reach out to others and it's kind of important that we do that because we don't want to neglect the primary responsibilities we have as a Christian to ourselves and our immediate family and our extended family so now we are, are really starting to get somewhere we, we, we've talking about the warrior of Christ end of the uh, spiritual development uh, spectrum or continuum and we're, we're really focusing on how do we love our neighbor so this opens an enormous world of opportunities for for the the christian so now we're ready to really explore 
uh, how we go about bringing the good news of Christ to the people of Corio. Um, and it is a huge many options that we have. Um, and uh, this is a real blessing for me to actually drop anchor here and start what I hope will be a series on, on teaching about who we're targeting and how we're going to target them. Because um, most of church culture focuses on uh, the, the young Christian. And um, so we're used to seeing our Christianity as something that we receive, that we go to church and we get something. But I'm actually challenging you to make our church experience about how do we love others? Uh, how do we bring the gospel to the people of Corio? Now, um, this involves understanding who they are and what they need and understanding the context uh, that we're in. And this is not something we talk about much in church, uh, but I think it's really, really relevant uh, to empower the warriors of Christ to bring the gospel to the, un- the non-Christians. So to start with, we're going to look really briefly at the fact that we're in a post-Christian cynical culture. Uh, there's this book I've been reading recently about bringing the gospel into a cynical culture that is sceptical against Christianity. Um, whilst we have a great Christian heritage, the current climate and attitude towards Christians in, in Australia in general is pretty negative. Um, and um, a lot of church leaders don't say that, but it, it is true. I'll give you a really good example. There's somebody in my family who grew up going to church occasionally, became part of the youth group of the local church and one of the leaders and was uh, really big on the a relational healing side, but not from a supernatural perspective. She never really had an encounter with Jesus or anything supernaturally that made her want to become a child of God. She she always sort of thought of Christianity as like a um, a reason for doing good. And today she's quite cynical and angry if if Christians try to tell her that their way is right. Uh, and, and lots of people, I suggest, in our society think that uh, there is no absolute truth. There is not one God that um, there's, uh, it's sort of what makes you tick and feel good on the, in your walk is appropriate, whatever that is, whether it's religion or, or um, uh, meditation or, or this type of lifestyle or that type of self-help thing. And in fact, it seems that Christianity has become one uh, thing on the self-help bookshelf, one book on the shelf help, self-help uh, bookshelf, if, if you like. Um, so we need to be aware of that when we are speaking to people who are in the world. Um, and this is a huge shift for each of us because we're not used to doing that. We're, we're used to focusing on our own little world. Um, and um, we've got to realise it's not about us, it's about them. And it's about us being kind. And so what we try to do in this uh, current climate is make relationships. Because there's an overlay that the church has, we hear about the church being involved in uh, sexual abuse and in different types of abuse, and embezzlement and um, some historic things with the uh, Indigenous people and whatnot uh, that are negative, that that people are hearing that these days and people don't actually have a background in the Bible anymore. The kids aren't hearing uh, RE or anything like that. So it's a post-Christian cynical environment. So in that environment, it seems that to build relationships of trust is is a critical element in bringing the gospel because uh, I don't want to believe what you're saying unless I believe who you are. Show me how much you care and then I'll listen to what you have to say, if you like. So um, that's a pretty important thing for us to understand. The other thing I want to put to you is uh, a lot of people think that here in 3214, which is the postcode of Cryo and Nor Lane, that people are poor. And um, if we look at a global historic perspective, nothing could be further than the truth. The people here have free accommodation, free health care, free education. And um, it's a welfare state and, it, and people here have no idea of work, a lot of them. No inclination to work for a living whatsoever. And um, so we don't need to give them food. We don't need to give them health care. But what is really interesting is they're lacking that spiritual spark, that purpose in life, that 
that um, the presence of God and the Holy Spirit Lord, would bring a cleansing to their soul, bring them a new heart that gives them a zest for life. Um, so this uh, harvest field here in Cray is actually really ripe for hearing the word in that sense, because there's a spiritual hunger, there's spiritual poverty um, here, and people are quite open to talk. And another great thing about the people here in Cry is they have a lot of time. Uh, they're not generally time poor. They've got time to do stuff. If you schedule stuff during the day, as long as it's after lunch, people will come. Because they've got nothing to do, they don't get up until lunchtime. I'm obviously generalising here. But we need to really understand the culture that we're targeting. So I'd suggest we target Cryo and then uh, forget about the rest of the world for now. We target Cryo. And then that becomes, well, who in Cryo do we target? What methods do we target use to target the different groups? So I'm going to show you some evangelistic strategies that we've been using. Now, Little Miracles Home Group, which is my little ministry here in Cryo, is about tree planting. So that is a carefully designed and targeted um, outreach to bring the love of Jesus and the person of Jesus. And it involves building relationships, making a, through, through tree planting, making a positive impact on the environment, uh, a positive impact on the community, uh, in, encouraging the kids and families to own where they live, to take responsibility for that, where they live. And it's got time on its side. It can take years to, to develop because I'm not going anywhere and we're going to, build relationships that uh, build up a bank of trust and integrity over time and then leverage that for the kingdom of God. And in this uh, little ministry where we're bringing in the word of God, so we're teaching them about Christmas, we're teaching them John 3.16 and um, teaching them about Jesus, little, little bits and learning, teaching them to pray. Uh, it's a new avant-garde ministry. It's experimental, but I think the basics of it are right. We're going to look at um, an outreach I've been doing with uh, Kiri and Leah, uh, Bellarine, Pray Bellarine. Now, we here's some footage of us singing. Um, soon as the restriction laws changed, we, we met down at the waterfront here in Geelong and we just sang um, The Blessing. So what that did was it wasn't a relational thing. These people didn't know us at all. They, they didn't know our names. We didn't talk to them. But we were doing from a spiritual intercessory perspective we were bringing a tangible and real blessing in the heavenlies over these people now they might not understand that uh, intellectually but something is happening we believe in the spiritual realm at that time but from a purely uh, natural sense these people are seeing Christians hearing some words of blessing that are touching them spiritually and that's like the presence of God so I think that's actually a really clever little outreach. It, it just predis positively predisposes them to the Word of God. And they would hear snippets of um, the, 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 the gospel and the love that God has for them and the reality of God through that. Another one is here we have us singing at, uh, at uh, the church building uh, last Sunday. Uh, staff crew organised a quick little... Um, get together for people who are particularly isolated to have a, uh, a time of worship. And it wasn't specified as an outreach, but having church outside has a similar effect as the singing one. People can see it, they can be curious, and they go, I wonder what those people are doing. And then suddenly they're a bit demystified because they realise, oh, they look like me. They're just local people. They're, um, they're just singing, they're passionate. And Again, this might not be an intellectual um, uh, evaluation that they're doing, but something's touching their heart. And that's something we could explore in, in future. The, 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 the final one I wanted to mention is, is Marie, uh, who's just recently done an outreach with some Af Afghanis, Af Afghan women. And uh, that has the, the thing of building up relationship over time, serving them. Uh, these women actually did need food, so she got food and they got beds and whatnot, and she was telling them that this is done in Jesus' name. So uh, all of these different methods of outreach are worth considering the pros and cons. Uh, and 
another overlay in all of this is sustainability. Like, um, how sustainable are, are the methods that we choose? Can we do them when we're feeling flat? <laughs> Can we do them when we're not, like, do we need to be super powered to do this? Can anyone do it? So this is thinking that I think we really all need to start sharing and experimenting in. And I suppose I'm giving you permission today to dream and experiment and to pray about new methods for reaching different parts of the cryo community. And obviously it is better to reach the kids in a sense because they have yet to go off the rails rather than focusing on the ice addicts who are locked away in their filthy houses and trying to reach them for Christ. Now, that would be a great thing to do, and I'm, I'm trying to do that. But actually teaching the kids the word of life in a, in a positive way and in a way of being active is actually really intelligent because they're less likely to go off the rails. And even when they do, they will remember some of the words of the gospel that God has put in their heart. That brings me to another quick thing as we think about evangelism. Uh, one church leader early on in my life said to me that evangelism is getting about people, getting people to church. And that really crushed me for years because um, I realised, as this guy Robert Coyle, who I'm about to show you, says that there's a whole ministry of seed planting, that um, we don't have to be worried about what happens after we share the word and, and, and show Christian love. In fact, if we do worry about that, we're going to be uh, disappointed. So um, let's just embrace the whole thing that just as a tree will spend a lot of time making a little seed, whether it's in an apple or in a flower, and it, it will know that that seed will disappear and it will never see it again. And it might not grow, but maybe it will grow. The tree's happy with that. It's happy to put in a lot of energy to do that. We too are the same. We're happy to make, to give of our word of God, knowing that it will bear fruit somewhere in God's economy. And that the very giving of that uh, is our ministry and not knowing where it goes or what happens. And even if they go to the Catholic Church or they go to the Revival Centre, they go somewhere else. Honestly, guys, our ministry is to plant seeds. And um, just quickly, you can imagine a great big tree. And the Lord says that he will make us a planting of the Lord, a tree of righteousness. And the wonderful thing about trees that people don't often emphasise in that teaching is that they produce enormous amounts of seeds every year, thousands and millions of seeds. So a mature tree, that's like us on this mature end of our Christianity, are producing loads and loads of seeds. And I'm saying we do that together. Obviously, the digital technology uh, provides us with enormous opportunities for outreach. Um, and this has been one of my personal passions for a long time, to, to learn how to get uh, fresh, punchy Christian uh, stuff out there to the youngsters. And um, recently it's been coming true here at Bethel with making lots of clips of testimonies and, and this type of thing. Um, now, obviously, this message is focused on um, Christians who are strong in the Lord. Um, but um, there's a group I wanted to show you quickly from New Zealand who have made a whole ministry about uh, bringing the gospel to where people are online. And uh, this is a very simple example. There's a typing tutor on the computer, online typing tutor, is a very common thing and popular thing. So these guys made a, a typing tutor. And in their typing tutor, it has games you can play, different typing games. And in there, there's the, the ultimate game. And in there, if you click it, there's actually a presentation about the gospel. Uh, so that's a very uh, clever way of meeting people where they're at um, online. And uh, there's a whole world out there of how to reach the pre-Christian that we as the church in Australia and in the world haven't actually spent much time or effort or money on and uh, I think our role here in Cryo is to, is, to, is to really jump into that space and to be uh, really effective and experimental and learn a lot, learn, learn, learn. What can we learn from these different methods? And um, so it's very important to highlight the fact that we're doing spiritual work with uh, our Heavenly Father as the ultimate um, leader and driver and 
reality behind all this. And so I'm resisting the idea of corporatizing our, our ministry and sort of making like expensive TV ads and trying to get millions of dollars to popularize the name of Jesus and the teaching of Jesus. I think from the very beginning, Jesus' methodology was always about ones and twos, the fisherman, the tax collector. Um, and so uh, we need to reflect that that we're not interested in building a big evangelistic empire, but we should focus on the ones and twos. And the, the, the very interesting overlay of all this is that we're following God and God's uh, might be calling us to rest and to do nothing, just to nestle into his love. God might be calling us to just uh, pray for our, our, our child or our sibling or our cousin. Uh, the Lord might be calling us just to focus on our job and to do that very well. Um, and so we have to be obedient to God and uh, follow the Holy Spirit. And so that is essentially a very, it's an ephemeral thing to do. It's difficult. It requires us praying a lot and spending time in the place of intercession and prayer. And I'm so honoured to be part of Bethel where there's this rich heritage of prayer for revival. 30 years Paul's been praying. In fact, uh, just the other day at series, that was the, the exactly 30 years ago, he started praying for revival in Cariah from series with a letter, led a bunch of people. So a very special uh, overlay is that this is a spiritual job. We are just sheep. We are just children. Our Heavenly Father knows what's going on, knows how to deploy us and how to bring the fruit that he wants to bring. So our prayer as we start to finishing up is for fruitfulness, that we'll be fruitful, whether we're, our job is to pray or whether it's to get down there and work hard for the kids or whether it's to give a Christian book to our neighbour or a meal or whatever it is, to give money or to give encouragement or just to hang in there in the situation that we have are in or even just to enjoy being with God that somehow that would be fruitful. Because remember the parable of the sower, that Jesus' heart is would bear fruit 30, 60, 100 times what was sown. The parable of the talents, that the man who produces 10 times what he's given is rewarded. Uh, the parable of the unfruitful fig tree, Jesus gives it, uh, it curses it because it doesn't have any fruit. Um, God is built into everything that he makes, fruitfulness. And that starts with kindness. It starts with a smile. It starts with listening. How are you? And then building that relationship and then praying that person into the kingdom of God. So I hope that today's teaching has been a, a, um, an eye-opening thing, giving us a bit of a framework for evangelism to understand it's okay to experiment. It's great to experiment. This is an area the church is not very good in, but we're as, as a whole, and we're trying and God's leading us to do it. And we've got to think it through. Who are we targeting? What do they need? And how do we build relationships and tell them of the word of God? So let's pray as we finish up. Lord God, we thank you for this moment, for our calling to bring the kingdom of God here in Cariah to work with you, Lord, for revival, to work with each other, Lord, for revival, to work with the church for revival. And Lord, we ask that you'd give us grace to see what the local people need and to, to find ways of building relationship and targeting the groups that are going to be receptive to your word. And Lord, to, to bring the word of God out there, to become really skilled evangelists. Oh Lord, we just pray for all the heartbroken and hungry and lonely people out here in Cariah, that your word would come to them in power, that they'd know that Jesus is alive and that that changes everything because we have a hope for eternity. And Lord, I pray for everybody watching this that they might know uh, your presence and re bringing redemption, your Holy Spirit bringing new life. And Lord, that they'd be encouraged by renewed purpose, and renewed vision, and knowing that you have, Father God, got us on a journey. We can trust you with our failures. We can trust you with our hunger, our loneliness, with our needs. And Lord, we just I pray that as we trust you, that people would know 
in their heart of hearts that you're you're there and that you love them so much. So guys, let's join together and love the, the people in cry, beginning with each other, with our, our friends and family, so that, as Jesus said, by our love, they will know that you're my disciples. Bless you.